But relationships, doesn't matter which type, friends, siblings, whatever, they are, for me, this is how I define them. They're really more about you seeing yourself, not about what the other person can do for you. So a lot of times we're looking for like, well, they ain't doing anything for me anymore. So then they're, or I fell out of love because they stopped doing this for me. Like, no, nobody promised you they're going to be doing anything for you, mm -hmm. right? <laughs> but if you use it as an opportunity to continue to put the mirror up to yourself, are they revealing something in you to allow you to grow, to evolve, to be the best person you can be on this planet? Hey, we win it. Hello and welcome to the Disrupt the Everyday podcast. We're here to help you navigate life while disrupting the status quo. Our discussions cover a number of topics relevant to everyday life. We discuss everything from relationships to entrepreneurship. We also engage in some difficult but important conversations. And now, here are your hosts, Brian and Tanya Hamilton. Hello and welcome to episode 26 of the Disrupt the Everyday podcast. On this episode, we're joined by Keisha Glimp, founder of True Control Fitness. Today, we discuss several health and wellness related topics. Keep listening if you benefit from learning about the importance of self-care and gratitude, dealing with grief and trauma, stress the silent killer, and having difficult conversations. Keisha, thanks so much for joining us today. Thank you. So wonderful to be here. Thank you for having me and thank you for having this platform. It is wonderful. Thank you. Well, thank you. And we'll start off the way that we always like to, and we'll start by asking you the loaded question. Who is Keisha Glimp? Who is Keisha Glimp? I don't know. Let me see. No, I'm <laughs> No. Who is Keisha Glimp? Um, I think a lot of times when we answer that question, it, it's like, what roles do we play? What is it that I'm, how am I operating in life professionally, right? Or what roles are we playing in our personal lives? So I always like to start when I really get the opportunity to answer that question, who am I? By saying things like, I am an authentic, vulnerable, open leader. I am courageous. I am loving. I'm supportive. I'm a free bird. I'm someone who catches on to the joke last. I can, <laughs> you know, I'm like, I don't know. What, what was that? You know, I can be a bit of an introvert. It, I can be a many, many things, but as we are really a lot of things, we are, are also no thing. And so, um, which allows me to be a bit of everything. And in all of that, in the roles that I play, my favorite one is being a fun auntie. So that's who I am. As far as what I do professionally, I'm a, a certified life coach. I'm an empowerment and wellness lifestylist. And I really love supporting people through their body being and beyond transformation, which kind of looks like in their body, I, I used to be a personal trainer, been in fitness for years. So in their body, it's all about the evolution and of supporting your well-being so that you can really be that bright light in the world and shine your light in whatever that looks like in the world, right? Because everybody's is different. And then in the being, if we're all gunked up with all the stuff we hasn't, haven't released, right? Then it kind of goes to that old saying of hurt people hurt. And so when we are willing to do our journey of healing, then we can then support others in their healing. And so I love working through the being and all of that stuff. And then in the beyond, it's all about that stretching beyond what you ever thought was possible. And that work where if you were willing to really undefine yourself around the, the self-definitions, you know, we, we create these self-defined things and it's like, yeah, but that's not all that's possible. So when you're willing to really let that go, what is possible? And so stretching into those scary spaces, the unknown, the uncomfortable, and going beyond what you ever thought it could be. So I love working with people through that. And I love seeing the transformation. I get goosebumps when I actually see someone come in one way and then they're like, right, right, you took it on. You did something <laughs> different, right? You didn't stay in that zone. And uh, I guess I've been doing that my whole life, but not necessarily intentionally, but that's what has me be where I am, right? It's just like, yeah, I've kind of lived nine lives and we can talk more about that, but I'm going to cut it off for now. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. Now you, you talked again about a lot of the roles that you're filling now. Yeah. And the one thing that I'm curious about, because just, you know, the, the research that I've done and correct me if I'm wrong here, but you used to be an engineer. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Good research. Yeah, I was. Uh, my degree is chemical engineering. So I was an engineer for four years. And I knew before I graduated college, though, that I didn't want to be an engineer because I, <laughs> I had done summer internships 
But I was like, you know, you go to Tuskegee University, you are not going there for acting, which was the thing I wanted to go into. <laughs> <laughs> you better go there for some agriculture. I mean, 85% of the Black veterinarians come out of Tuskegee University. So mm -hmm. that's a huge, it's veterinarian, agriculture, engineering, and architecture. It was not for acting. <laughs> so, so I was like, well, wherever I graduate, when I, wherever I, you know, go, like get a job and move to, I'll start studying acting. And I did. And that's what I meant by like, I've lived about nine lives. And when people say like, how did you get from, what, what are you doing now? Right. <laughs> so I've had that question many times in my life. What is Keisha up to now? Oh my goodness. What is this girl doing now? And it wasn't always comfortable. It wasn't always comfortable. It, it felt cool with me because when I would choose something different. It was like, okay, that's where my heart is leading me. That's where my spirit is leading me. And though I may be uncomfortable, this is what I want to be up to, right? But it didn't always feel comfortable in regards to like, what did my, what would my parents think? Thinking about what others would think, mm -hmm. right? And so that grew into like, I had to learn to be that. I would still choose it, but I would, but now it's like, I do it. And it's like, yeah, I don't, I don't even know what y'all thinking about over there. I am moving this way. And it is so blessed me over and over and over again, even though it was not comfortable, not easy. And there were times I didn't know when my lights would be turned on, you know, if my lights were on when I came in the door. So, but it's a choice. I would never change any of it. And Brian, you put something on your I think, I think it was your personal, but it might've been the disrupt that, no, I, I can't remember. It was somewhere on Instagram. <laughs> you put one of those quotes and it was Lucille Ball's something like, um, I rather regret what I, I rather, if I'm going to regret something, I want to regret what I did, what I didn't, what I did do. I don't mm -hmm. know something about regretting. I don't regret anything, but like, I don't live with regrets, but that is one thing I've always said is that I rather have done it. I don't want to be 90 years old talking about what I would have, should have, could have done. Yeah. yeah. Um, I'm more scared, more afraid of what's not going to happen. Like what, like, okay. Like versus I didn't do it and I stayed comfortable. So I said a bunch, but no, yeah, I totally I get it. <laughs> yeah, no, I totally get it because I think a lot of times you see the opposite and people stay, right? Like it could be right. those jobs. Geez, it could be relationships. It could be so many things that people stay in just for that comfort or the, well, what will people think? Like all that kind of stuff. And so, you know, to be le released from that, you know, I, I'm assuming it's a freeing feeling. It releases Absolutely. stress. Like yeah. I'm looking at Keisha right now and your skin through Zoom is flawless. Oh, <laughs> There, I don't see any wrinkles. Of what I, just said. And I don't see any words. wrinkles, ladies. And yeah, I'm just like, wow, that's through Zoom. <laughs> so, you know, to live that and to have that stress-free living, you know, it, it people say it shows on you physically when you're stressed, when you're feeling those ways, right? So yeah, yeah, which is a huge part of self-care. Like it. Mm -hmm people often think of wellness and fitness as like, we're going to work out and we're going to eat well. And there's so many other components, right? You know, it's like, how well are you sleeping? The impact that it makes, like you're not making up on sleep when you miss it. You're just, you can't catch up. It's sort of like when you brush your teeth, if you miss brushing your teeth, the plaque has already done the damage, right? <laughs> now you can go brush the plaque off, but it's already done what it's going to do, right? Mm -hmm. And so the aging mm -hmm. has already taken place when you miss your sleep. So like being able to get rest and reset your body is huge. And then all of this other stuff we're talking about, like living your life fully out, it makes a huge difference. Like being able to live it and not live it by your own definition of whatever it is versus other people's noise. That outside noise, it's just talking, right? It's got a lot to say. And that can come from your parents, right? Even as you raise your little ones, mm -hmm. they are, you know, what, like allowing them to be free to be fully expressed because I'm sure you've seen their personalities mm -hmm. when they were tiny, tiny, tiny ones, right? It comes out so funny. They're all four different, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> They're all four different. So allowing that. And I think um, through the process, just learning to like choose you, choose yourself, be able to listen to that voice 
and not have to follow anyone else's is a huge part of, uh, of self-care. Yeah. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of components. I mean, we could just talk for days about the components, right? It's like, um, how are you nurturing your body? You know, with, with, are you taking long baths? Are you walking? Are you de-stressing? Are you sitting in the sun at all and getting some vitamin D? Are you sitting still long enough, you know, to, um, to come out of all of that brain work that we do during the day? A lot of times, are you taking that time? You know, it, it just is so many pieces to it. But what I found is it's not about the like, what all are you going to do? Cause you might not be able to do all of it. You likely won't but are you choosing to go on the journey? Are you choosing and willing to do, do it? And part of that is, is yourself, like looking at yourself and being willing to be still enough to see it and be okay with what you see. Mm -hmm. Be okay with what you see. Cause it's all great. Right. Willing to change some things around if you're not okay. Yeah, right? absolutely. So, okay. S sticking with the self-care, you yeah. talk about self-care habit you know, we've talked a, a little bit already, but can you go a little bit deeper with that? Yeah. So I started this thing, I don't know, several years ago where it was a practice we were doing with a group of mine called uh, 10 before 10. So it was like 10 things you'll do in the morning for yourself before 10 AM when you give yourself to the world. And so like being able to, and you can call it whatever, power hour, you know, just your self-care time. I started calling it Keisha's playtime because I get to have fun in it. I didn't want to call it work, like Keisha's work, you know. And so in that, there's a morning practice I have, but then there's also a bed prep time. And a lot of times I don't think we take that. We don't think about the bed prep. We simply, the only bed prep we might do is set the alarm for the next day. Right. But actually, like, let me pull away from my day so that I can set myself up for the win for tomorrow. So it's beautiful. I'll, so I'll start with that, the nighttime prep. Nighttime prep is like shutting down your electronics 30 minutes or more before you go to bed. So don't go to bed with like, I just finished watching a scary movie, like bang, bang, and you're trying to sleep. <laughs> like, no, or falling asleep with the TV on. So there's no TV in my room. Hasn't been for years, right? No, no TV in the room. When you go to bed, now I felt a, an extreme difference when I shut my phone off, like completely off. I even like just because I want to feel different. Like I'm going to put it in the other room. Like I don't even want it there because what happens is we have this, we all are electric beings, right? So the electromagnetic fields around us and we're being affected all the time from these devices all the time, right? So, so being able to shut down and now I also do, I might do a meditation with my phone right by me before I go to sleep but I still make sure I turn it off and then get the phone out of there. So things like that, deep breathing, that's a huge one. Being able to inhale deeply to your highest and exhale fully out using your diaphragm. That is really key. The breath is so important. And a lot of times we're not even thinking about all that it's doing, right? So it's shifting our respiratory system, our blood system, like just everything, every system in our body is regulating and supporting. So yeah, so deep breathing. And there's this, it, one of the things that I don't do all the time, but I do every so often. And it's on YouTube. It's from Dr. Wayne Dyer, who's one of my favorites. And he has this, you could just, re, you could just YouTube search Dr. Wayne Dyer five minutes before bed and you'll get this little recording. And he's basically talking about like going through the things that you appreciate, that you are grateful for, and that you actually accomplished instead of going through your head on like, dang, I didn't get this done today. Oh, that didn't happen. Today. All of that stuff, right? Because all of that makes a difference in our subconscious when we go to bed. And so whatever it is that you can do to fuel yourself before bed and prepare yourself for good rest, right? Because it all makes a difference in what type of rest you're getting. I use essential oils. I use that those before and after in the morning and bedtime and through the day as well is diffusing right now. So essential oils make a difference. Certain oils like 
let's say a juniper berry. Juniper berry is great for nightmares. It's great if you are scared, if you have fears that are coming about. So it helps to relax you on that. Oils like lavender or Roman chamomile are great calming oils. So it helps you get a wonderful rest and really deep. Cedarwood is another one. So lots of great calming oils. We have an oil called Breathe. It has respiratory blend, so it helps to open you up. So mm-hmm. it's just all types of things, but it's really just to prepare yourself. For some people, well, I'll just say just lots of different oils. Let's just say that. And then prayer can be a great nighttime uh, preparation. Whatever it is, it's just getting yourself centered and grounded before you go to bed. In the morning, it's a great ritual to do the same types of things, but it's more to kind of bring yourself to the day setting intentions for the day. What is it that you want to want it to look like? I like to do earthing, which if you're not aware earthing, it's basically, you can go search it for a deeper explanation, but it's basically grounding with earth because we are so removed from it, right? We're wearing shoes all the time. We're walking on cement. A lot of us, I mean, for me living in New York for 16 years, I'm no longer there, but when I lived there, I lived on an either third, fourth or fifth floor walk up. And I was always far removed from the earth, right? But the earth is very grounding. It has negative ions. So if you take your shoes off and just stand on earth, it's actually been proven to heal different things in our bodies. Right. So doing that during the day, then that way you're also outside with the sun, right? You're outside with the sun. I mean, you know, unless you're in the snow, but, (laughs) but they're, they're all types of great things. And most recently I've had a kind of an afternoon ritual, which kind of happened for me. And I just went with it, which was, I don't have kids but I have a neighbor that does, that's ra- raising a child and they're his, uh, his great grandparents. And so he like wants to spend time with me because there's no one to play with. So I get to go outside and teach him how to do cartwheels and play basketball. And yesterday he had me outside do, <laughs> doing hide and seek and racing. And I thought I was, you know, 12 years old again, apparently, but my body <laughs> told me differently when it was time for bed. But it's allowing myself that break and understanding mm-hmm. the value in that, not just for him, but for me. Awesome. And so I, there's a practice. I leave my door open when I'm able to play and he comes over, he sees the door open, right? So I, there can be many things that we do for our day, but it's just being aware enough to see what's needed in the moment, right? And mm-hmm. so, so I always stay alert to those things and to do them without the pressure that you don't have time and that somebody else needs something more from you because nobody needs anything from you. Like you're not able to give it anyway Mm -hmm. if you're depleted. And so by you fueling yourself first, it's going to open up so much for you to be for somebody else. I even heard that on one of your podcasts. What is her name? Denise Drinkwalter. Yeah. Yeah. That was so beautiful when she said the impact that it made on her, on her children and her, mm-hmm. or her grandchildren when she ran the 10 K and they showed up for mm-hmm. it. Right. Because she was like, I was just doing this for me. And then <laughs> imagine what that, what that does. So that's really In everything I do, that is the main reason I love to do it is because my favorite word is oneness. And I truly believe that when we get that we are one, one with nature, one with, you know, one with each other, there's no disconnect between anything or any person, then we understand the impact when we don't choose to take care of us, because then we can't be all that we were sent here to be, whatever that is, whatever your belief in that is. No, I like that. And I think right now, you know, it's even more important because a lot of people are still working from home with this pandemic, right? Uh And home makes things a little bit more convenient. And it's like, oh, I can stay in the office. I don't need to come up for lunch or I don't need to go and get that walk. I, you know, I can just keep doing right. Mm -hmm. So I think it's even more important now, but then eventually people are going to be going back into the office the majority of the time. And I remember when I was working outside of the home, it was like, okay, lunch was great, right? Because that was the time for me to try to be a little bit productive Yeah. because, you know, when I got home from work, it was like back to full on parenting and dinner and all that. So I used Mm -hmm. to like try to get to the gym or try to do a walk or something Mm -hmm. like that, even if it was running errands. Mm -hmm. you know, but something for yourself to get away from your desk, 
Yeah. And I guess, yeah, that oneness that you were talking Absolutely. about. Absolutely. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. It's, it's, yeah, it, I, I like to look at it like I'm included in the love. Mm-hmm. If I'm going to be able to give my love to my children, my nieces, nephews, my aunts, uncles, my world, the people who I'm speaking and sharing myself with, I can include myself in that. I'm not separate. I'm just not separate from it. And that's where oneness comes in. When you get that, it's like, well, then I'm not doing anybody a disservice. I'm actually, that's how I can be in service if I'm able to give to myself first. That's it. Love it. (laughs) <laughs> now i have kind of a random question it's a little bit off topic but <laughs> okay i can roll with it <laughs> but but just something that we have in common is when people hear our name it's spelled differently than how it sounds so my name my name's brian b-r-i-n-e the, uh-huh. the story behind it is that my great-grandmother who's irish filled up my dad's birth certificate and spelled brian the way that she said it ah. and then i just was named after him they you know they didn't decide to fix it for me but <laughs> You know, your name is Keisha with an ER. Yeah. I'm just curious if there's a story behind your name. Absolutely. I love it. <laughs> I got this question. My aunt named me Keisha and, and the origin of why, you know what? I would have to go back and ask her why she actually named me that. But the story for me is more so dealing with that name or like how I experienced myself with that name. So I guess when I was a kid, you know, that thing that, that as kids, often we want to fit in. We don't want to be different. <laughs> we want to like, it's just Keisha, like any other Keisha, you know? <laughs> so my first grade teacher called me Kish. I had people call me Kaiser, Kaiser, like, ah, uh, it's just Keisha, you know? So I would just have such a tough time. I would simply say, it's just Keisha, like the Keisha that ends with an A, right? But once I, I guess, I don't know, I must've been like college years or something. And I just remember going like, I actually appreciate this ER, you know, I want it to, I want it to be different. I've always appreciated my uniqueness, but not in my name. And so I started owning it as like, yeah, it's Keisha, you know, but even when I say Keisha, people don't hear the ER. Um, (laughs) And so, you know, and the, another funny story that happened with my name was when I was an engineer. I had a group of people that I worked with in another country. I think it was like Indonesia somewhere anyway. So we never saw each other. We only operated from email, right? And so when they finally came over to, you know, visit and uh, they met me, they were so confused because they were like, "Uh, I thought your name was Kaiser Glimpf. (laughs) You know, I looked like a German man. They thought I was a German man because my last name is German. (laughs) I'm like, yeah, it's kind of been one of those things. So yes, with a a name like that, you know, it just, it stands out. It is, um, you know, but I've, I've really grown to appreciate it more than, you know, because, hey, it's only one of me. I don't know any other Keisha glimpse. (laughs) So, Yeah. But when you're trying to hide, it's not good. <laughs> right. <laughs> you know, it's not, you can't hide. It's like, oh, there's only one of her, you know? <laughs> so, there you yeah. go. You got your answer. <laughs> <laughs> oh man, the, the uniqueness of life, right? It's funny how like when you're a child, you think it's like the worst thing to be different, um, you know, whether that's physical name, all those things. And then as you get older, you actually can appreciate yeah the uniqueness in that right yeah Uh uh-huh yeah and I look at like I could look at anything and make it into like wellness and your your best feeling your best and that for me is huge like imagine the people who never get to that place or sometimes when people say like it's okay you like however you pronounce it it's okay like you know and I'm like no no we don't then like, how do you want to be pronounced? How would you like it to be? And like really commanding that, like, um, th- this is who I am and this is what I want. And some t- everybody looks at it different. Sometimes people might be like, oh, it's a name. It doesn't define who I am. That's absolutely fine, you know, but, but just however we are able to be well with that, you know, mm-hmm. be okay with that. So thank you for asking me that. <laughs> You're very welcome. Okay, so I wanted to touch base on triggers. So on your Instagram, I saw that you had posted a video and it was titled Triggered Much. 
Mm -hmm. So you had said like, if you're feeling upset, bothered, hurt about something someone else has said, or, you know, done to you, you may want to actually stop and thank them. So I didn't get to watch the whole video. I watched most of it. You can share with everybody else what you were talking about with that. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) This is one of my favorite topics. I, you know, and it's something that gave me so much peace once I got that whatever somebody is feeling about you has nothing to do with you. It is just free, right? Like that's their stuff. And that's their stuff to work out, whether they choose to do it, whether they're aware of it or not, that's theirs. It's not yours. And you're just the person in front of them that, that is reflecting it, you know, bringing it up. And so if you in turn are triggered by something someone else is doing or saying, then that's your work. And so it makes me think about like relationships. And I believe I shared this in that video. I don't remember, but in relationships, doesn't matter which relationships, it could be the intimate relationships, um, especially parent-child relationships. Because even though I'm not a mother, um, quote unquote, I'm a, I'm a huge observer of parents. I've always been that way since I was a kid. And so I'm like watching like, hmm, you know, but relationships doesn't matter which type, friends, siblings, whatever they are for me. This is how I define them. They're really more about you seeing yourself, not about what the other person can do for you. So a lot of times we're looking for like, well, they ain't doing anything for me anymore. So then there, or I fell out of love because they stopped doing this for me. Like, no. Nobody promised you they're going to be doing anything for you, right? (laughs) But if you use it as an opportunity to continue to put the mirror up to yourself, are they revealing something in you to allow you to grow, to evolve, to be the best person you can be on this planet? Hey, we winning, right? Now, is it something for you to address? That's a different thing, right? And, And if it's not, like if it's bringing something up, and you're not willing to address it, that too, it shows you yourself, right? Like, yep, I'm doing it again. Or yep, I chose the same man. Oh, oh, here we go. I'm doing the same thing, right? (laughs) Or, right, and so like, it's all a part of your journey, right? But uh, often we want to go point the finger, point the finger, point the finger outside of you. And it's never, ever 100% of the time outside of you. And I shared this with a friend of mine and that person called me back. I don't know how long, maybe a year later. It was like, oh my goodness, I finally got it. I like, it is so freeing. I'm just looking at people now going like, you know, this isn't about me, right? You know that whatever Mm -hmm. you're going through right now has nothing to do with me. (laughs) I'm like, trying to tell you, man, it's not, it is not about, and I don't mean like 80% of the time. I mean, every time, every time. And it's not a, It's not, it doesn't mean that 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 person should or shouldn't be doing whatever they're doing or that they are, that that they get to keep on treating you some kind of way. It doesn't mean that. It doesn't mean that, that just means that that's their work and you, you have your work and you can't control whatever they're up to or how they're being, right? And so watch out, like, thank the, that person. They brought up a trigger for you. And mm-hmm. it, uh, it can allow you to go deeper to see where that root is or to see like, okay, I have been doing that same thing for years and now I'd like to elevate or I'd like, to, like it to be different. I want to feel different. Where does that come from? Because we all have stuff right? We all have stuff. And I don't care how great your parents were. I had great parents. Awesome. We all got stuff, right? And so that's the piece is to me, like the sooner we can get to something I always like to say is like, the sooner we can get to the acceptance of things, the sooner we can get to the healing of things. And then the sooner we can get to the love, because at the end of the day, that's all we want. We Mm -hmm. want the love. But if we don't accept it, like I want to, I don't want to accept this person because they'd be in some kind of way. And now there's that, like, then you're fighting what is, it just is, it doesn't make it right or wrong. So now you're in judgment. Now you don't want it to be, and now you're fighting what is, it just is. And then you can get to how can we be, how can we be present in this? And how can it be different if I want it to look different instead of fighting what is? So 
I, I don't know what, I can't remember what happened in that, that moment that I shot that video when I was on my walk and I was yeah, like, you were on your walk. You know, I was talking about a trigger. Yeah. I was like, yeah, honey. <laughs> Speaking even from even saying some of that stuff probably triggered some people. Like, what she mean? <laughs> what she mean? And they th- no, they did such and such, and they wrong for that. Like, <laughs> speaking from experience, right? <laughs> I, the thing is, it's hard, right? Because you can accept, but you talk about that healing. That's yes, where I think yes. so many of us, like you yeah. know, me included, can get stuck. Yeah, it's like. You, you can project all you want to the other person, right? Yeah. But why do we, why do we project in situations? Because we don't want to own what we have going on, right? right? It's so hard. It's so hard. <laughs> you know, I used to talk with, um, I used to facilitate a group for abusive men. And we mm-hmm. talked about the different reasons why, you know, there would be abuse. And one of them, it was projection because they were like defense mechanisms, what we called it. They mm-hmm. were looking at, well, you know, I'm saying this, I'm saying this to you, but what are, what's that person really feeling? Right. So that person was maybe belittling their spouse and treating, you know, saying this, that, and the next thing, but really they were most likely feeling that about themselves. They just projected that. And, you know, and then I realized that's not just abusive relationships. That's so many of us, you know, Right. So yeah, it, you, yep. the act and then the healing process and how to really work past that can be difficult yeah. if, you know, people don't have the right tools, but it's doable. Right. So. Right. Yeah. Well, that's, that's, um, that's that being aspect that I was talking about, mm-hmm. you know, um, you know, it, it's a process that I've been mean, for years, I would say my twenties, I spent in kind of denial that what had happened to me, like now I speak it so freely. So I'm happy to say it because I say it all the time, but I don't ever like shocking people Mm -hmm. when I say it. Um, So I'll be gentle. I'm warning you. This is the me (laughs) saying I'm warning you now. Um, But yeah, um, I was sexually abused as a child. I, you know, bullied as a child. I, and I had a father who was a jokester, right? He didn't mean any harm. He loved me how he knew how to love me, but that's how I caught on to, I didn't catch on to the joke too fast, you know, because he had a joke about that. But I internalized that as I'm not good enough. I'm not smart enough. But guess what? I went through life going, I'm not smart. I got to be smart. Like I'm going to, you know, which was one of the reasons I got that chemical engineering degree. Mm. So like you said, the fence mechanism, there are also coping mechanisms that we get along the way based off of who we've been, what we've had to go through. And so um, the, the piece about it is going through my 20s of kind of not really even realizing that it had had an impact, that that sexual abuse had had an impact, right? Or that I was so, that my father's stuff had done that, right? But then getting into my 30s and starting to do that healing work was amazing. Like, my father just passed um, from COVID in mm-hmm. October, right? <clears throat> Sorry. And when people ask, like, you know, when uh, checking in on me and how am I doing, I can say the most, I felt many things, right? And my sister just texted me and said, I'm having a moment. She sent a picture of my father. And I'm like, I've been having moments from yesterday to today. I don't know what it is, but mm-hmm. I've been speaking to him and loving him. And it's all great. But I cry. I smile sometimes, I laugh because he was hilarious. But the most I felt it feeling that I've had has been gratitude, like grateful for the number of years I did have with him, grateful because I did my work with him. I spent sp- like three years, mm, three intentional years of really like doing my healing work with him. And I spent the last two, uh, last year and a half of his life closer to him. So I left New York, not knowing I was going to spend that much time with my father. So, you know, things happen in the universe. Mm -hmm. You don't even know that that's going to happen. And I can't be anything other than grateful because it, I wouldn't have even been able to do that work, that time with him, spend that kind of time with him. Had I not done my healing work with him, whether he was aware of it or not, I was on a journey of doing healing work and choosing him. And so that's the piece that I really love sharing with people in how when you choose to do your work, you're like, you're so liberated from the storyline that you've created. And there's no need for you to be like, have the expectation for that person to love you how you thought that they should have loved you. 
you don't have to have any kind of expectation. It just is. You can accept it and you can like appreciate and you can move on, <laughs> you know, but a lot of times we're not willing to look at, look at ourselves in that, that way and look at that person and free them as well from it. Mm-hmm. Because at the end of the day, especially with parent work, like I find a lot of people don't do a lot of their parent work and we go through life looking for our partner to make up or fill that void for that work that we didn't do to hold the space that you didn't get. You didn't get held. Now you want somebody to hold you down. You know, it's a, it's, it's a lot. It's really deep. But it's like you said, Tanya, it can be very scary to kind of point that finger back at yourself. Mm -hmm. Um, but when I finally wrapped up my work with my father, it came because I start realizing that I started pulling away from him. I started like calling him less. I was in New York. I stopped calling. He was in South Carolina, like stop calling him as much. I'm, you know, when we talk, we're very surface. I was being purposeful and intentional. Like, look, man, you don't even get it. I can't even believe you. Then he don't, but I'm not saying any of that. I'm just, this is how I'm feeling. And finally, I woke up and said, hmm, I don't think he even notices that I have pulled away. I don't think he even realizes it. And even if he does, I don't think he would say anything because that's not a comfort for him. Mm -hmm. He's not going to lean in and say anything. And so I finally said, you know what? Um, I think you're going to need to take your own coaching advice, which is the person who's done the work, the person who's more equipped with the tools, like you said, right? That's their responsibility to have it be different. Because why are you waiting for them to be different when they don't have the tools, the capacity to be different? They don't have it. Mm -hmm. So now you're waiting for something that just simply is not going to happen. Right. And so I just said like, okay, well, here it is. Do you choose your father? You choose him or you don't choose him. And without hesitation, I was like, I choose him. And when you choose somebody, you can't choose part of them. You can't choose the things you love and the sweet parts. You got to choose all of them. And I said, I choose all of him. And then I booked a flight and came home and had my final conversation with him about it. Like, we need to have this final conversation. I need you to know how I felt. And then I need to release it. And Mm -hmm. what I did coming back to wellness, the next morning, my knees felt better. Now, I know I just started talking about something completely different, (laughs) but if you go Google, (laughs) go search emotional body chart, and you'll see that all of our emotions, like they still, they're trapped up in our bodies. So when we don't do that healing work, we have stuff in our bodies that create all of these illnesses, right? And then it creates the Mm dis-ease, disease, right? It's just... It, and we want to think that it's coming from the physical first. It's not, right? It's all this other stuff we haven't been able to release, which leads me back to your original question about triggering, <laughs> right? And if you're triggered, you know, like, hey, look at that as a, a information so that you can start doing your healing, both physically and emotionally, right? It's all of that stuff. And with the knees, just for everyone to know, The knees in the emotional healing chart represents stubbornness and like rigidness, not willing to bend, (laughs) Mm. (laughs) right? And it awakened me quickly, like, "Mm, that is in my family, like period. And in my whole, like a lot of my father and his siblings and our family have knee issues. And it just made all the sense in the world. When I woke up that next morning and my knees felt better, right? It just made all the difference in the world. Like I got it, you know? And those are things you can start cluing yourself into, right? Because every part of our body has a different emotional impact. The liver represents anger. The kidneys represent fear. You know, our shoulders, our back, every organ in our body has something and represents something that if you were to tune in that way, it it could help you to understand when you go to the doctor and they can't find the they don't see any test telling you anything. The results are, co- I have no idea. Uh, well, yeah, it's that other stuff that it started with. And it's not about the physical. The physical happens after you haven't done, you know, you haven't looked at the other stuff, the, the emotional and spiritual work. So, so good. I feel like I need to say like, amen to that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Oh man. I know that. Amen choir. Yeah. (laughs) 
Yeah. And I think too, it, it's all also, dep- you know, who you're interacting with in those situations, right? Like you have a parent, an older parent, you know, different cultures, like so many things where they were never really taught how to dig inwardly, right? And look yes. at the, it, those feelings and all that kind of stuff. And, yes. you know, that's also hard. So the important part there is, you know, and I've learned that too, is I, I have to do my work for me or I, even my conversations for me and know yeah. that I may not get anything back from it, yeah. right? But yes. at least I've released it. So I yep. can, to- yeah, totally agree on that one. And it's awkward. Like when you first started doing it, it's very awkward. <laughs> and it's very, you know, even, it doesn't even need to be conversations where you're feeling hurt and stuff, just like deeper conversations, not so surface. Right. But eventually, hopefully it brings out um, you know, something that can be a benefit to both parties. So, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. yeah. Yep. Yeah. I, I'm grateful for it. I really am. You know, it's like, I knew I made that man uncomfortable. I was just like, <laughs> yeah, I know you're uncomfortable. Like, but this is the reason why you're so uncomfortable is not just because you weren't trained to be open. Cause that's the huge piece. Right. And I got like, you just, and he would even say like, we never talked about this stuff. You know, like, I'm right. like I get it. Right. I get it. But if I get to be the vessel for you to, like, I'm actually your mirror. That's all that it is. The reason it makes you so, really makes you uncomfortable is because that means you got to look at you. It doesn't, it's not my stuff. Mm -hmm. It's making you look at you. And, you know, that's, that's just evolution. It's what we are because our parents were typically, you know, he was on another they weren't, their parents weren't worried about that. They were just able to feed them and mm-hmm. get them, you know, listen, my father picked cotton. He was, <laughs> they were on a whole nother, you know, um, plane. I understand mm-hmm. that, but we get to shift and evolve and be mm-hmm. different. And so that's really like when I'm looking to be different in my nieces and nephews lives, like, yeah you actually can speak your voice. It took me years to find my voice, to allow myself to be seen and heard, you know? And so it's like, yeah, you're a child, you get a voice too. Mm -hmm. And had I known that, I may have spoken up when I was a child with what happened to me, Mm -hmm. you know? And so we just get to be, you just keep evolving. Yep. Keep evolving. Yeah. It's great. No. We, uh, you know, that was kind of a, a deeper dive there now. Just... <laughs> I know. <laughs> you thought you had me on here for wellness and fitness. I, it's just all encompassing. I told you I'd be talking about everything. Yeah. You know? but I guess the question is, how did your dad's knees feel after the conversation? <laughs> <laughs> Let's just say I told him mine were feeling better so that he in the hopes he would start releasing some stuff himself. He was yeah. shocked and he, you know, so... Um, he got a little better at, at opening up, but, uh, yeah, I can't say his knees got better because he has to really do the work, you know? So, so yeah, but, um, some other things start showing up. So I'm, I'm proud of him, you know, when it was all said and done, I'm proud. Now we, we did, uh, obviously you talked about the emotional body chart there and just some of the impacts on your, on your body of not you know, not, not taking those steps to make sure that you're releasing all of that. Uh, just, in, just from a perspective of self-care, just kind of circling back to what we were talking about earlier, what are some of the impacts of, of you know, really not having those practices and not taking care of yourself? Mm. So I want to start with stress because I think that that's such a huge impact. Mm. And I think it's what I like to call like the silent killer, because if you eat something and it's not something that's nutrient dense and it's not good for you, or it's, you know, it's going to make you feel heavy. You feel sleepy, right? You kind of know right away. It's pretty quick. You eat too much of that. You start gaining weight. You start seeing that. If you miss sleep, you're dozing at the desk. You, you know, you feel, you start getting anxious or you just, whatever, you can't operate. Maybe you don't have mental clarity, but with stress, is such a long term that our bodies can take often that, and I just think you can sort of get used to it, that it's just, it's, it's kind of normalized in a way. And so, and, but I think we're dealing with that probably more than the other two, because it's probably the start before the other two happen, 
right? Before the eating happens, before the sleep happens, you might be missing that sleep and eating the way you're eating because of stress. And so if we start with stress, it's such a, such a key piece. So the impact that that has, e- eventually it starts to show up in the physical stuff, right? We might start, our hair starts to thin. I've had people's hair just like really start falling out, finding bald spots. We, it can have that same kind of effect, like having low energy and not being able to perform at your highest, mm-hmm. kind of foggy brained, you know? getting absent-minded, like forgetting to do certain things, not being present in people's lives, being sort of like, you know, you just you, like self-focused because you're so stressed about what's not happening, that you're so focused on what you need to do. And then no one else really gets the best of you. But it ultimately, it can really lead to those really deep conditions that we may have, Right. So it may really lead to the the heart disease and the pancreatic, you know, cancer that we may be seeing. Like, so when we don't release that stress or like find ways to de-stress, like we were talking about earlier, it can, in the long term, it leads to something else. So if, if you're working to not ha- get to that place. And if you could just start practicing it now with the early signs, like early signs, like my shoulders are tight, you know, I'm not digesting my food well. And so now my food can't come out. That really means you're just not digesting something that's going on in your life, really. Like you're not really taking it in um, and letting it out. So there's, if you could just pay attention to the signs before you get to that place where now you have to make a decision, you know, it would make such a big difference. So yeah, there's just so much that um, I just don't think we are, we're paying attention to. And I I think our, just how we be, just (laughs) how we be in the world, you know, being present, being still, being mindful, all of that is way more important than some of the things we think that we have to do. Like, I don't have to go run a, a, you know, I don't have to go run a marathon. I don't have to do all of those things. I don't always have to eat the perfect thing, but be mindful. Even be mindful of how you eat when you eat. Are you always eating where you're like um, texting and, you know, taking a bite here or still on your computer? Uh, Like, are you stopping to pause ever? Or are you just in that? Even when you take a shower, are you constantly thinking about what you need to do when you get out the shower? <laughs> so yeah, like just being present and, um, and practicing presence and being and slowing down makes a huge difference in stress. It's funny how you say be mindful because if my kids are here, I use that a lot. It's like, be mindful, <laughs> be mindful of the tone. I didn't say anything rude, but your tone, right? Be mindful. Right. <laughs> be mindful of how you do this. Be mindful of how you do that. Right. right? It's, but it's so true because sometimes, you know, so many people like, you know, we talk to you, we talk to other people and, you know, they, they say very similar things, um, you know, taking that time to be, or to, you know, take care of yourself and all that. And then society is just going the whole opposite way and saying, rush to do this, rush to do that, rush right. to get you there, you know? And mm-hmm. sometimes those are the things I'm, I guess you could almost say grateful of the last year and a half on that part where life has slowed down extremely. Mm-hmm. Right. Yeah. And so, you know, you almost think like, thank goodness for that. And then whenever there's a day where it gets hectic, I'm like, oh my goodness, I'm not, I'm not used to this. Right. Right. You got to get back adjusted. Right? <laughs> you actually have to write more than a couple things to do on your day. It's like, oh my yeah. goodness, I'm not used to rushing out the door and getting the kids here and there. It, it's so important, but it it's just like interesting that everybody says this, but then society's telling you that you do have to rush and it, you know, you don't, you can take the time. And the other thing too, is it doesn't necessarily take a lot of time to do these things, Mm -hmm. you know, whether it be that you choose to work out or, you know, and that could look a whole bunch of different ways, the way you choose to eat, the way you choose to take care of your mind and the spiritual aspect, all those things. It's not this long process that needs to be drawn out. Right. It's, I guess, and I'm sure you would say to the people that you work with, it's what you can do. 
at least if you're doing something is better than nothing, right? Isn't right. that what else? Right. <laughs> right. Yeah. Yeah. That, that's so true. It, it's, you know, sometimes I even say to myself a little trick, I have to play with my mind. Sometimes if I, if my mind starts to say like, girl, you do not have time to do this extra little thing. Right. And then I go like, how much time is it really? Mm-hmm. Oh, it's really going to take me three minutes. That's really not long. You know, like <laughs> I, it's really not going to take away from my day. It's actually going to add to, and it's only this amount of time, like just do it. You know? And another thing too, is um, when you were talking about like slowing us down and there are times when we, you know, have to do things, more things that in our day is that concept of balance. You know, when people talk about balance, it's like, it's a great concept. Be nice. We can get there, right? <laughs> However, what if what if someone were to just simply say that's never possible? Could you deal with that? Can we just deal with like it may not even be possible? If I had everything on a scale and it was a five part scale and I put five different parts of my life on that scale, my fitness and well-being, let's include my spiritual life in that. Let's say whatever I'm doing for my career, let's put that on there. <clears throat> let's say my financial life, my well-being, let's say whatever I'm doing in the community outside of what I do for my job. And let's say my relationships, let's just say those are the five, even though we know that there are probably more, right? <laughs> Would they all be balanced? You know, Would they all be the same weight at all times? Probably not. And so if we can simply accept that I'm not like, okay, you know what? I'm doing really good in these two areas right now, right? I am contributing to the community and I am being with my family and my relationships. Boy, I'm rocking those out. But over here is not really working quite as great, but it's okay. They'll have their moment too. Right now I'm focusing right here. And that's another part of like well-being where we can just simply accept that like we aren't machines. We don't like our parents didn't have to deal with nearly what we had to deal with. They had to deal with their own set of stresses we didn't have to deal with, which is a lot, right? Mm -hmm. But we have a whole, like my mind can't take all of the, the being present on social media, knowing all of what's going on in the world, having, dealing with all my family and what I'm trying to produce is like, so I have to, I get to manage that. And that's the piece. Like to me, it's like being clear and aware of that and setting your boundaries around what you're willing to take in and, and not feeling obligated. And that's why I wanted to talk about that wellness, uh, self-care without the guilt that you're mm-hmm. like taking away from anybody. You're, you're actually, you know, contributing to us when you give to yourself. Well, I think we hit a, we hit a broad number of topics. Is there, is there anything that we didn't ask you about that you'd like to discuss now? I don't think so. We did touch a lot of stuff, huh? Mm-hmm. <laughs> it was a good one. That was a good conversation. <laughs> thanks for going all different ways with us. <laughs> yeah, well, thanks for going with me. I, you know, it, it's, it's one of those things. I often say when I'm talking about the body being and beyond, it can encompass a lot of different things. And so, um, so thank you for allowing this. And it's just been beautiful vibing with you too. Mm-hmm. Yeah, thank you. Thanks. Likewise. Yeah. Now, for everybody who wants to shout to you after they've heard this, what's where can we find you? Well, the main space is going to be Instagram. Because if you go to Instagram and you hit that tap link, you're going to see all of the stuff, right? So if you go there, you'll find everything. I have a free body being and beyond guide that's there. And, and it really is kind of that starting space to open yourself up to take a peek into it's a 28 day guide to support you in diving in the body being and beyond. You can also go there and book a discovery call because I do one-on-one coaching to support you through that journey. And, and then if you want to be a part of my essential oils community, because I do essential oils, um, definitely jump into that. But all of that can be found right on Instagram at Keisha Glimp, K-E-I-S-H-E-R-G-L-Y-M-P-H. Perfect. <laughs> all right well thank you so much for taking the time keisha we appreciate thank your you. time and and all of your insights thank you so much thank you thanks for listening to the disrupt the everyday podcast for more ways to listen connect with us on social media to be a guest or to partner with us check out our link tree at disrupt the everyday join us next time for more ways to disrupt the everyday